Hello everyone. Uh, today I want to talk about Newton's laws of motion. These are three laws attributed to Isaac Newton uh, that he discovered, which, um, which describe motion for basically all things in the universe. Before the Renaissance, people didn't really think in terms of mathematical principles by which the universe obeys things. Um, for instance, the ancient Greeks said that, you know, when I push that, it eventually stops. Why does it stop? We now know that it stops because there is uh, f forces acting on it called friction, and that friction takes kinetic energy out of the eraser and makes it stop. But thousands of years ago, people distinguished between heavenly matter and earthly matter. They said everything on the earth and of the earth, like us, and the trees and grass and mountains and I think everything except air was earthly matter. And then everything in the sky, the air, the sun, the stars, the planets, that stuff was all made of heavenly matter. And the moon is also of heavenly matter. They noticed that as the, as the day and night wears on, those things are constantly in motion. They're always moving. The stars move across the sky during the night. The sun comes up every day, and they always keep moving. So they figured, well, maybe heavenly matter is just in its natural state in motion, and earthly matter is in its natural state at rest. Um, so that sounded like a logical explanation, but it turns out it's not true. And Isaac Newton discovered uh, three laws of motion that apply to not only things on earth but things in the heavens and things everywhere. And those those three laws we just call Newton's three laws of motion. Newton discovered these laws by doing scientific experiments. Experimentation became the way people uh, in the Renaissance, it became the way people decided on how things work instead of coming up with philosophical rules by which things should be behave. They started doing experiments and deriving uh, um, principles based on these experiments. So he would do things like roll balls across smooth surfaces, trying to reduce the friction, and eventually concluded uh, three things which we now know are true. And let me just state them. Law number one, so this is Newton's laws of motion. And the first one, the first one is a little bit wordy. An object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will remain in motion constant speed and moving in a straight line unless acted upon by a net outside force. pretty wordy. An object at rest will remain at rest, and an object in motion will remain in motion at a constant speed moving and moving in a straight line unless acted upon by an outside force. What does that mean? That means if an object is moving, it is going to keep moving, moving in a straight line at a constant speed unless an, a net outside force is, is exerted upon it, or an object at rest is going to remain at rest. In other words, there will be no acceleration unless there's a net force acting on an object. So, um, so this means that that eraser should keep going unless there's forces slowing it down. The forces that are slowing it down are frictional forces. Turns out on Earth, there's a lot of friction in our environment, and so objects tend to come to rest a lot more often than they do for the planets where there's relatively little friction 
in their orbits around the sun and the stars in their orbits around the galaxy and so forth. So these heavenly objects are really no different from earthly objects, but they're not subject to the same, uh, uh, they're not subject to the same environment. Um, and he said, this law applies to all things, not just heavenly objects or earthly objects, to everything everywhere. So it's, it's a sort of a universal law of motion. And as far as people have been able to tell by experimentation, this law really is correct. Things don't accelerate unless acted upon by a net outside force. Now, what is this? What's this word net mean? Well, an object can have forces on it like this object has forces on it right now. Gravity is pulling it downward, but my fingers are pulling it upward, and the net force on it is zero. So net, when I let it go, the net force is then not zero, so then it accelerates. But the net force on this is zero. So you can have forces on an object, but still have a net force of zero. So anything that's sitting on a table, standing still, has, well, just about everything has forces on it, but if the, if the force is net to zero, summed to zero, uh, then they won't, they won't accelerate. So, you know, in this case, my hand is pulling up on this marker, and gravity is pulling down. The sum of those two forces is zero. So, okay, this is Newton's first law of motion. Newton's second law is much less wordy. F equal ma. This describes uh, if if there are net forces on an object, this tells you what the acceleration will be. F stands for force. That's the net force on an object. M, the mass of the object. A stands for the acceleration of the object. Now notice I've got a line over the F and the A. Those are they, that's called vector notation, and to a physicist that means that this is one of those quantities that to completely describe the quantity you need both uh, a number and a direction. So, for instance, acceleration. Uh, this thing accelerates due to gravity at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared straight downward. So that's complete information about the acceleration. Force is the same way. I'm pushing against this board with, I don't know, 30 pound force or something and that force is associated with the, the magnitude of it, the 30 pounds, plus the direction that I'm pushing. I'm pushing approximately straight north. So that's complete information about that. And, um, and the fact that this equal sign is here means that the acceleration will be in the same direction as the force. That's all that means. Um, okay, so that's the second law of motion. Now the first law of motion is really sort of contained in the second law because it's just saying things don't accelerate unless there's a net force on it. And that's really described here. If the net force is zero, then the acceleration is zero. Uh, so this law is a little bit redundant, but, um, but it's still considered one of Newton's laws of motion. Now notice, for a given force, the heavier an object is, the smaller the acceleration will be. Okay? So, does that make sense? So if I exert uh, a 50 Newton force on something with a relatively small mass, that's going to be large for the given force. Um, let me, I'll do a couple of problems with this in a little bit. Let me just state the third law. This is also a bit wordy. If object A exerts force on object B, then B exerts an equal and opposite force on A. So that means when, when a, an object has a force exerted on it, it exerts uh, an equal and opposite force on the object that's forcing it. So I mean, uh, like for instance, um, I'm exerting an upward force on this marker, 
it is also exerting a downward force on my hand. I can feel the weight of it. It's not very heavy, but um, but there's it, it there's it always goes two ways. Now, when I let this go, it is attracted toward the Earth because the Earth is exerting a, a gravitational force on it. It is also attracting the Earth with that same tiny force. Now, the Earth is extremely heavy, so it doesn't really move very much when I let this go. But theoretically, the Earth is, the center of the Earth is actually coming to meet this thing. Okay, so these are Newton's three laws of motion. Now that we have Newton's laws written down, I want to show you a few examples of the importance of these things, how they apply to physics. Uh, first, I want to show a few examples of Newton's third law, how the, the um, if object A exerts a force on object B, then B exerts an equal and opposite force on A. Why that's important? It's really important in most physics problems that physicists deal with. Uh, but let me show you a few sort of more obvious examples. Um, <clears throat> when you're in your car and you're driving down the road, uh, how does your car obtain acceleration? Well, it, uh, the engine turns the wheel, right? It twists the wheel, which exerts a force on the road. The road exerts an equal and opposite force, and it accelerates the car down the road. Now, uh, now this force is the important one because it's the one that's accelerating the car. What about this force? Is it accelerating the Earth in the opposite direction? Well, theoretically it is a tiny, tiny bit, but sort of negligibly small acceleration. Um, where it's more obvious is with an airplane. So here's an airplane with a propeller. The propeller spins around, again, because of the engine that's on the inside. And as the propeller turns, it's tilted, and so it pushes backwards on the air. That actually moves the air backwards, uh, a very measurable amount. But since Newton's third law holds, the air pushes forward in an equal and opposite way, and the airplane gets thrust that way. Um, with a jet airplane, it's pretty much different. Air is, let me show the jet, the jet intake here. Here's the pilot's thing. Air is sucked into the, into the front. It goes through the engine and is blown out the back. It's more or less like a propeller airplane in that the air is being thrust out the back. Uh, and the, there's, so there's a force backwards on the air and an equal and opposite force in the frontwards direction of the air pushing against the fan that's on the inside of the airplane. A rocket, I didn't leave myself much room, A rocket is kind of like a jet, except all the material that it, that it spews out the back is stored on board the rocket. And so a jet is flying through the air, sucking in air and blowing it out the back. Uh, but a rocket has all the material on board, um, and it undergoes a combustion like um, a rocket fuel might. Uh, there's some oxidizer and some reactant that, uh, that react together and and expand and that goes blasting out the back so there's a force on the gas pushing out the back and an equal and opposite force on the rocket from the gas and that's how it gets thrust now rockets are important in space flight because uh, prior to the early part of the 20th century people had no idea how to get up get up into space they knew that the space was up there and that there was no air in that uh, so People thought, well, how can, you, how can you take an airplane up to these high altitudes if there's no air to push against? And then it was realized in late 19th century that a rocket could uh, take us into space because it doesn't need to push against anything because of Newton's third law of motion. Um, there were criticisms of the first rocket designers that they didn't understand that something had to be pushed against. No, it's not that way. The, Newton's third law of motion allows us to fly in complete vacuums, and that's why we have space flight now. 
Okay, so there's just one or two examples of the importance of Newton's third law, but there are many more. Let me talk about Newton's second law. F equal ma. Now, I'm not going to put the lines over it because <clears throat> the lines mean it's it's operating in three dimensions. I'm just going to show you some one-dimensional, um, some acceleration in a single dimension where we don't have to worry about the the three numbers thing. Okay, so let's say um, let's say I have a cart and it's it's a 50 kilogram cart and I want to move it here and I'm going to press on that cart with a certain amount of force let's say 100 newtons of force the newton is the SI unit of force uh, one pound is equal to about 4.448 newtons so a pound is a unit of force I mean when you're holding when you're holding a one pound object in your hand the force against your hand is one pound and that's about 4.448 newtons so that gives you a, something of an idea of how big a newton is so here I'm pushing on this 50 kilogram cart with 100 newtons force and and this will tell me the acceleration that's going to have so here's my force 100 newtons there's my mass of the object that is going to be accelerated so I just divide both sides by 50 kilograms and that's equal to 2 meters per second per second. Now, you may look at these units, newtons over kilograms, and why that reduces to meters per second squared. Uh, a newton is 1 kilogram meter per second squared. That is the amount of force required to accelerate 1 kilogram at an acceleration rate of 1 meter per second squared. So 1 newton is so you can sort of get your mind around that. So if I put this in here, kilogram meter per second squared, the kilograms cancel and you have those units. Units aren't radically important in this course, but I just thought I'd explain that uh, in physics, the units do cancel like the numbers do, and everything comes out even in the end. Okay, so if that's 50 kilograms, and I'm pushing on with 100 newtons, it's going to accelerate at 2 meters per second squared. What if I put another 100 kilograms on the cart? So now the mass is 150 kilograms. It's heavier, so with the given amount of force, with the same amount of force, what would you expect? A greater acceleration or a smaller acceleration? Well, you know intuitively, you've all pushed carts before, like in the grocery store, and you know that the heavier it gets, the harder it is to push with a given amount of force and the smaller acceleration you're going to get. Newton's law just reflects that. So here, let's put in 150 kilograms um, Whoops. So now it's 100 kilogram meters per second squared over 150 uh, kilograms, which is, what, well, that's, that's two-thirds meters per second squared. So before, <coughs> Within the first case, the acceleration was was two meters per second squared. Now it's less than one meter. It's only two thirds meters per second squared because I, uh, the acceleration is one third what it was at first, and um, because I had three times the mass. So this law should make basic intuitive sense. The larger the mass is for a given force, the smaller the acceleration should be. Right. Um, to me, this is one of the more intuitive physical laws, and it does seem to hold exactly for everything that operates in the universe. Okay, now I want to do a, uh, an experiment. All right, I've got a little track here in the cart. It rolls pretty smoothly on this track. And a little fan. If I put the fan on the cart, now when I turn it on, it'll accelerate down the track. 
So the fan is pushing on the air, which is pushing back in an equal and opposite force. And that is the force that's doing the accelerating of the cart. Now there might be other forces on the cart. Now you know there's vertical forces, right? Gravity is pulling down and the track is pushing upward. So there's really no forces, no net force in the vertical direction. Um, and I've got this as level as I could get it. So if it was tilted that way, obviously it would begin to accelerate because gravity would be pulling it a little bit downhill. And if it was tilted that way, it would have trouble climbing the hill because gravity would be pulling against it. But I've got it pretty level, so it's not going to get any uh, force from gravity. There might be friction forces, though, slowing it down. And we'll probably see that as I go through this experiment. So what I'm going to do is, you see this mark right here, and this mark right here, i got two pieces of tape. I'm going to time it over accelerating over that distance, and I'm going to do some analysis to find the acceleration that it's undergoing, and, um, and then find the, the net force on it. So what I'll do is this. I'm going to start this timer when that takes off. So I stopped the timer when it got here. So I timed it from, a, that took 2.56 seconds. So it, I timed it from a standing start and, um, and timed it over a set distance that I know. This is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 centimeters, which is half a meter. I can calculate the acceleration from that, knowing that it took that amount of time. Because when an object Is leaving this around. So <clears throat> when an object starts from a standing start and accelerates at a constant rate, the amount of distance that it goes is related to the time by this equation. Distance traveled, that's the acceleration, that's the amount of time that it's gone. So let's say the acceleration is two meters per second squared. After one second, one squared is one, times two is two, times divided by two is one. So after one second, it will have traveled one meter, right? What about after two seconds? Two squared is four, times two is eight, divided by two is four meters per second. What about after three seconds? Three squared is nine, times two is 18, divided by two is nine meters per second. So you see, the longer it goes on, the further it goes. Uh, it goes geometrically further the longer it goes on. That's because it's accelerating. So every, every subsequent second, it's covering more ground. So it, uh, the distance actually goes up according to the square of the time. Okay. So let me calculate what the acceleration is for this. Let's see, that took 2.56 seconds. Uh, so, let's see, it, it uh, accelerated over 0.5 meters. I want to find the acceleration. It took 2.56 seconds to do that. I can just solve this for A, right? Multiply both sides by 2. And let me see what that is. That's the acceleration. Um, so I'm going to do that a couple more times um, with a greater amount of weight. So let's see. I'm going to put this weight on there. Now, first of all, now it's heavier. So the force is going to be the same, basically, because the, the fan has, is running the same speed, so the, the force due to the fan is going to be the same. There might be more frictional forces, because it's heavier now and the wheels are, are probably going to be subject to more friction. But we would expect the acceleration to be lower, because the mass is higher with the same force, right? Let's see what happens. So that's 3.47 seconds. Indeed, it took longer 
to uh, cover that distance with that much more weight. Um, so let me just write that down. And now I'm going to try one more thing. I'm going to put another weight on here. Now I do it one more time, and you would expect the amount of time to be even greater because now I even have more weight on there for a given amount of force. And it's going, to, it's going to accelerate at a slower rate. It's going to take longer to cover that distance. I didn't stop that long. Okay, that took 4.1 seconds. Now let me do a little analysis of this. So I have three cases. In each case, I have a little bit more mass. So let's see. The first one, with just the fan and the cart, I weighed them, and that's about 0.187 kilograms of total mass. The second one was one of those weights. Um, it was about 1.311 kilograms. The third one added another weight. It's about 1.805 kilograms. So there's our three masses that were being accelerated. Uh, the distance that they were being accelerated was all 0.5 meters. And the, the times were uh, 2.56, 3.47, and 4.10 seconds. Okay? Now for each of those, I can figure the acceleration, because remember the acceleration was just, um, was, I took it from this equation, acceleration was just 2d over t squared. So, I can't remember what acceleration, so let me just calculate those. <clears throat> So using this distance and this time, I get an acceleration of 0.153 meters per second squared. This one is 0 0.0831 meters per second squared. Higher mass, so for the same force I get a smaller acceleration. And this one's only 0 0.0595 meters per second squared. So again, I just took two times that divided by that squared. <clears throat> and so for each of these, I can figure out what was the net force doing the accelerating because I now have the acceleration and I know the mass of each one. So I can calculate each of those. So let me go calculate that. And here are the numbers I get. 0.125 newtons, 0 0.109 newtons, 0.107 newtons. So they're not that different from each other. You'd expect them maybe to be the same because it's the same force doing the accelerating, right? The fan. The fan hasn't slowed down or anything. Um, so the accelerating force is the same. But remember, it's the net force doing the accelerating. So the more weight I put on there, the more friction the wheels are going to have and the more resisting force there is. So, <clears throat> I've just calculated the net force doing the accelerating for this fan. <clears throat>